Today, I'm going to finish up describing the mechanics of the Malthusian model. Then I'm going to illustrate why it leads to a completely different economic system, where most of our intuitions about what's good things for a society are wrong, uh, and where you actually get, up until 1800, the claim is we get this completely kind of topsy-turvy world, where a lot of the things you think would be bad for a society turn out to be good, and the good turn out to be bad. Okay? And then once I've done that, I'm going to go on and start on chapter three, and start describing empirically, this so far is just a model. It's a picture about how the world should have operated. The next question then that always comes up is, how well does that model accord with uh, reality? And in, so in chapter three, we'll actually look at some evidence from 5000 BC on what living standards were, and look at living standards across the world to see if the, this picture here actually uh, presents the world. And the claim was going to be, it works surprisingly well as a description of the world before 1800. So what were the last things we had to do in terms of laying out this model? Uh, I've shown you how we can think of the world just in terms of a birth rate schedule, with birth rates increasing in income, a death rate schedule, with deaths decreasing in income, and then a connection between population and income per person, where the higher population is, the lower is income per person. And then what we see in this world is that if we want to increase living standards, then it has nothing to do with the production technology in the society. Living standards here are determined totally by birth rates and death rates. There's nothing that we can alter about the production technology that in this Malthusian world will actually change living standards. And so it turns out the way that we can most easily see how to improve living standards is simply by reducing the birth rate at all standards of income. That will have two effects. One is it'll push this equilibrium in this direction here towards the right, and that will increase material living standards. But secondly, because life expectancy is the inverse of the birth rate, it'll also increase living life expectancy in these societies, right? And so that part actually fits with our normal intuitions, and that all seems to work fine. But there's a second kind of surprising way in which living standards can improve in this pre-industrial world, and that actually comes through an upward shift in this death rate schedule. And that doesn't have a completely beneficial effect, because what it's going to lead to now is much higher material living standards. And I'm going to give you some evidence showing that shifts in that death rate schedule in pre-industrial England, as a result of the onset of the Black Death in 1349, tripled living standards, material living standards in England. It can actually have a very powerful effect, shifts in that death rate schedule. But it does have this bad effect, which is that at the new equilibrium, both the birth rate and the death rate are higher than before, and consequently, life expectancy will actually be shorter. Right? So you live a very rich life, but on average, a shorter life. But that really depends on the idea that this birth rate schedule is, is upward sloping. And we'll actually see that it can actually be pretty flat in the pre-industrial world, in which case, higher mortality rates could actually systematically simply lead to better living standards in the pre-industrial world. And so that's one of the things we're going to see is counterintuitive about this world is that a lot of the things that we think would help people uh, now are going to turn out to be things that will increase mortality. Okay? And similarly, if we have improvements in medicine in this pre-industrial world, um, what that will actually do is actually reduce material living standards. So any gains in knowledge about healthcare <laughs> and benefits simply of, of keeping people alive will increase somewhat life expectancy in the pre-industrial world, but will reduce material living conditions. Uh, again, let me just tell you a little bit of an anecdote about uh, healthcare. So it, it turns out to be a, a fortunate thing that before 1800, they really, doctors could do very little to actually uh, keep people alive. 
But it turns out that uh, Samuel Pepys, in his diary, actually does go through a dramatic medical procedure. And that is that he has a gallstone, which is causing him incredible pain. And so we've got detailed descriptions of that gallstone being removed from his diary. And what's amazing is that they use no anesthesia. Uh, and uh, the surgeon actually came himself and two big, strong men. And their purpose was to hold, keep the screaming patient still uh, while the procedure was, was undertaken. It's amazing that that pain was enough to actually persuade Peeps that he really was going to do this. And the other thing that I had actually imagined was that, that they would use alcohol and as, an, as an anesthesia. They would just get you blind drunk. It turns out that they believed that you should not do that. There should be absolutely no alcohol because they believed it would actually increase the bleeding. Uh, and the way they actually removed uh, the gallstone was to go through uh, between his legs. Uh, and the skill of the surgeon was to get it out in something like 60 seconds or less. Uh, because at, then after that, there was the risk that the patient would simply die from shock. So they did actually have some medical procedures. Peeps was successfully cured. We have the diaries of that surgeon who operated on him, and he actually succeeded in that operation with all the people he worked on that year in London. The next year, he killed everyone he operated on, and because we believe his instruments got infected, and that consequently, everyone he operated on died. Uh, so that it turns out that they did actually, you know, they were exploring medical possibilities here. But it turns out that the major things that killed people were epidemic diseases, uh, things like tuberculosis, cholera, uh, and stuff like that, which involved uh, 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 bacteria and viruses. They really had, uh, up until 1800, very little defense against. And so consequently, they're really not able to do much in terms of uh, uh, lowering uh, this curve. OK? Um, so <clears throat> that's the nature of this world. And one of the things that emerges kind of immediately is that one of the additional readings I gave on chapter one was this article by Jared Diamond, who argued that agriculture and the invention of agriculture in the Neolithic, settled agriculture, was actually going to make people worse off than they'd been in hunter-gatherer society. And what you can actually do in terms of thinking about these curves is see that it's not at all obvious what the effects of agriculture will be. Because agriculture is going to actually have two systematic effects. One is it's going to increase population densities. And with higher population densities, people are exposed to much more uh, infectious disease. And in that sense, agriculture would actually make people better off materially because it would actually drive up the death rate in these societies. In these small hunter-gatherer bands that make infrequent contact with other people, infectious diseases have a hard time maintaining themselves. And so uh, consequently, the actual arrival of settled agriculture, you would think, would actually drive up uh, death rates uh, within these societies. And we do see in the pre-industrial period that the most dangerous places for people in Europe are in the big cities, where there's very high concentrations of people. And in somewhere like London, even though it's the richest city in the world in 1800, in the 18th century, it's estimated that it was losing a third of its population each generation, simply because people couldn't maintain themselves in the conditions of London. They were living well, but the disease environment is so bad that London is, in fact, a huge sink of people. There has to be continual huge in-migration from the countryside in England in the pre-industrial period to simply keep replacing the population in London. And it's actually an interesting question to reflect on is, did people in pre-industrial England know that they were making that choice? And that choice essentially was you could go to London and live well, but with high probability leave no children, and also with relatively high probability die young. <laughs> or you could stay in the countryside and be healthy but it's boring, there's not a lot of excitement. Uh, and the people actually were making this kind of trade-off uh, within uh, pre-industrial uh, Europe. And we see the same things in Amsterdam and other cities across Europe, that uh, living conditions can actually be very good in some of these places in, in material terms, simply because they're actually chewing up people. They have this very bad disease effect. 
But uh, in terms of Diamond's argument, that's one effect that we get with sedentary uh, lifestyle. A second effect, though, is that <coughs> settled agriculture could also reduce the death rate because it allows you to store food and to actually have a store against uh, accident and disaster. And you see with hunter-gatherer bands that they basically have no stores of food. They have to live from day to day on what they can find that day. And so they'll go through extended periods of hunger uh, when it's the dry season or the animals are not available or the, the stuff that they gather, the fruit that they gather is not available. And it's impossible for them to store against these calamities. Whereas with settled agriculture, now you can actually maintain large stores of food. And so that could have the opposite effect of actually reducing death rates and then consequently reducing living standards. And similarly, in terms of fertility, one of the benefits of sedentary lifestyle is that it's possible to actually increase fertility in those circumstances. Because hunter-gatherer bands move every day, they have to achieve a spacing of children. You can't have a child every year because someone's got to carry these young children, and there's a limit to how many you can ca carry. And so what actually we'll see in hunter-gatherer bands is that fertility tends to be limited by social customs, some of which uh, prohibit intercourse within something like two or three years of the birth of a child uh, in order that that spacing has to be at an interval at least two or three years. And the, the Aceh, one group that's been uh, studied intensively, who uh, were studied in Paraguay in the 1980s, um, one of the big features of Aceh life is uh, the time that comes when the child has to start walking. And they have to start walking very young to keep up with the band. And what will happen is the parents just put them on the path and leave. And it's up to the kid. <laughs> you can either catch up with the band or they won't come back for you, <laughs> right? Uh, it's just it's one of those rituals, but it comes at age three or four when you finally now have to, to keep up with the rest of the group yourself. By the way, they, they actually, I mean, they, they, they're a fascinating group, and if you ever get a chance, I'll actually put uh, the information about this book about the Ache on the website, because it really is a, a fascinating society. I mean, I'd say existing within the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, and one thing is that is it, uh, it's a very violent uh, hunter-gatherer society, uh, and people develop a kind of very robust sense of humor in these circumstances. And so um, what happens to uh, old people in this band, right, again, is that if they get too sick to walk, they have to be left. And so they'll actually beg their children to kill them rather than leave them to the vultures, right? And there'll just come a time, or if you get wounded enough, there'll come a time where the band just has to abandon you. Uh, and so what that effect we would see would have is, again, that would increase death rates in hunter-gatherer society, but reduce them in sedentary society, since you're not going to be killed by an illness that would just mean that you can't walk for three or four days. That's enough to kill you in Aceh society. So there's one nice account of a guy who got sick, he got a fever, he couldn't walk, he was left behind, and somehow he recovered. But he was lying there, and the vultures had gathered in a tree above him, <laughs> waiting for him to die. And so when he recovered, he finally caught up with the band again. He managed to find them again in the jungle. But he was covered in vulture shit uh, from the time that he was lying there. And from then on, his name amongst the band was bird shit. <laughs> Even though he'd had this miraculous recovery and survival, all everyone could think about was uh, the circumstances of his return. And so you'll see that you know, it, it just creates hunter-gatherer society, these different stresses and strains where you're not exposed to infectious diseases, so that actually can increase your, your, um, uh, your, sorry, reduce your death rate in these societies. But you've got food storage, you've got any accident that means you can't walk can mean that you're, you're out of the game. And so that, again, would, would increase the death rate. And we just don't know what the net effect of these two things would be. And that's why it's just going to be an empirical matter. What is the effect of uh, uh, the Neolithic Revolution? And similarly, with fertility, uh, there we might expect that fertility would increase with the onset of settled agriculture. The effect that that would have would actually be to reduce living standards in these societies. 
but we'll actually see that all of these pre-industrial societies seem to have some kind of social control of fertility. And so these other societies manage to adopt customs or practices that actually reduce their fertility. And so again, we'd see that if anything, uh, the onset of settled agriculture should tend to increase fertility, but in fact, the effect is about, uh, th there's no net effect. N overall fertility rates are about the same in hunter-gatherer as in settled agrarian societies. But that's why, as I say, it's, it's going to be an interesting empirical issue. What happened to human living conditions as we move from the Stone Age uh, towards the modern world, you could actually go one way or you could go the other way. And the nice thing about having this Malthusian framework is that then you can actually think about, well, what are the things that should matter, right? And so that's what's really nice about this, is any, any framework like this, it gives you a way of kind of framing the question, what things should we look at in terms of uh, thinking about this world? Now, in, in terms of the actual model, the last thing that I wanted to talk about is, well, what did this imply about political economy in this world before 1800, right? What policies could governments take that would, in fact, increase the welfare of their citizens or reduce the welfare of their citizens? And some of those things, some of those virtues and vices turned out to be exactly uh, what we'd expect. And so uh, it's clear that fertility limitation is a virtue and fecundity is a vice within this Malthusian world. But after that, a lot of things get to be somewhat counterintuitive. So bad, in terms of living standards, material living standards, bad sanitation is in fact good, and cleanliness is in fact bad. And this actually, we'll see, shows up in, the, in that when I show you the, the evidence on material living conditions, we're going to find that England in 1800 had material living standards about two and a half times those of Japan in 1800. What do we think the major explanation of that difference is going to be? Right? In terms of this Malthusian model, it could be differences in fertility, but we'll actually see that they're, they're relatively limited, the differences in fertility. Japan probably has slightly higher fertility than England, but it's pretty limited. And so in terms of what creates that, it's actually got to be that somehow there's a higher death rate in England at giving living standards, that somehow the Japanese at much lower living standards have roughly the same death rate as the English have at much higher living standards. And the question is, well, what could underlie that? And here, as I say, this is all, it's not known, but it's speculation. Here, what's impressive is that pre-industrial Europe seems to have had very poor public sanitation and very poor sanitary practices. And we get a lot of evidence that I mentioned already with uh, Pepys' diary that uh, we know that the uh, Europeans tended to bathe very little in the pre-industrial era. Though actually, interestingly, an article in the uh, New York Times recently c uh, claims that we have become addicted to bathing in modern society in a way that's actually unhealthy. That our bodies are designed not to be washed all the time <laughs> and that they actually produce oils that are designed to protect the skin and that we keep washing these away. Uh, and that, you know, if you think about the hunter-gatherer lifestyle, you certainly didn't bathe uh, every day in that uh, lifestyle. Uh, but one thing we know is that uh, Europeans didn't wash, but perhaps more importantly, the disposal of human waste was very poorly arranged in most of Western European society. And so in big cities like London, what would actually happen is that the householder in the basement would have a pit where all the human waste was gathered, and then it would be emptied by the night soil men uh, at intervals of months or two months or three months. And so even the very richest people in England are in fact sitting in these houses in London which are on top of piles of shit in the basement, right? And it just seems amazing that these were the sanitary arrangements. And in Pepys' diary, one time he goes down into his basement and the neighbor's cesspit has overflown into his basement. And so he's ankle deep in his neighbor's waste products, 
Uh, and, but that's how even the rich in London were living in this period. And again, there's very poor arrangements in uh, 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 places like European cities. A lot of waste is just thrown into the street. There are open sewers in the middle of the street. It's, it's just surprising how poor the, the sanitary arrangements are before something like 1800. It's very quickly after 1800. They start to change this uh, dramatically. Uh, but we think that that's one reason then uh, why uh, Europeans were actually dying at this relatively high rate and living relatively well. Another feature uh, in Europe is that uh, they had a lot of domestic animals and they um, tended to live pretty closely with them. And so there's a, a nice uh, other uh, kind of uh, feature in England in the 17th century was that the government passed a law saying that it was entitled to take anyone's floor in requisition for national security. And the weird thing is, why would the government be interested in people's floors? Well, it turns out that most housing of that period actually just had beaten earth flooring. And then in the countryside, it would be covered by a layer of straw that would be periodically renewed. But you basically, the foundation would be this, just this clay, beaten earth uh, flooring. And what happened was that sanitary arrangements were so haphazard, both with people and with animals, that over the years, these earthen floorings acquired very rich dressings of urine. Uh, it turns out that urea is one of the things you need as a precursor for making gunpowder. And so as armed conflict in Europe increased in the 17th century, and the government was looking for sources of uh, urea to make gunpowder, it turns out that the floors of old established English houses and barns were actually uh, rich sources of this. And so you actually passed a law saying that in government interest, you could come in and actually seize people's floors. We don't know how many actual housing floors were seized under this law. But again, it gives some indication of just how closely people and animals were actually living in pre-industrial Europe. In contrast, in Japan, as I mentioned, in part for economic reasons, waste was actually very efficiently dealt with, human waste. Uh, because it was a very intensive system of agriculture that relied on intense treatments of manure to maintain yields, all human waste was actually of high value in agriculture. And so both urine and feces were harvested. I mentioned you paid your rent in part in the cities by human waste. Uh, that was actually hauled off, but the Japanese actually were very good about treating it before they applied it to agriculture to render it less dangerous, right? There's a lot of danger that comes from applying human wastes to agriculture. Uh, and so that was taken care of. The Japanese also bathed assiduously. Uh, they didn't have domestic animals. Uh, and also they had a culture that emphasized cleanliness within the household, right? And the continual sweeping and clearing of houses. In the English Civil War in the 1640s, the royalists, the, the rich party, uh, took over Oxford as their headquarters. And when the cavaliers, the knights, left Oxford, the colleges had a lot of work to do cleaning out the fireplaces that they had used as latrines in the rooms that they had occupied. Uh, and so this is, as I say, the, the habits of the upper class are sort of just surprisingly filthy in pre-industrial Europe. But it turns out this is a virtue, <laughs> this is a vice, <laughs> right, in terms of living standards in this world. Question. Uh, bad sanitation. Sorry, my spelling is bad. Pardon? And fecundity. Okay. So fecundity means having lots of children, right? Beef. So uh, th that's one uh, virtue and vice. What else is a virtue? Violence. Uh, what is a vice? Peace. <laughs> uh, how does that come up? Um, it turns out that, again, taking pre-industrial Japan, in the Tokugawa period, Japan achieved extraordinarily uh, internal stability, and they actually banned uh, uh, gunpowder weapons from inside the country and had a very effective system of keeping control of local feuding within the country. And so it's actually a very peaceable society in this period. Um, and also externally, it engaged in, in very little warfare. It basically isolated itself, right? And so there you can have at one extreme a society with very low rates of violence. Similarly, actually, um, Pre-industrial England, uh, in terms of domestically, uh, 
had very low rates of murder, even in the pre-industrial era. Rates of murder in England in 1600 are less than in modern America. Right? It's actually a very uh, peaceable society. One of the ironies of this, by the way, in terms of incentives, because now people believe that it only with very harsh incentives can you control crimes like this. As a, 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 an oddity of English law, in uh, the pre-industrial era, for most of that era, anyone who was literate could escape conviction of, for murder. It was a, a peculiarity of English law that somehow had developed. And the reason for that was that in the Middle Ages, uh, clergy could only be tried in ecclesiastical courts. They couldn't be tried in the lay courts. The test for whether you were a clergyman in the Middle Ages was simply, could you read? Right? Because only the clergy were literate. Almost everyone else was illiterate. And so that became the established test in law of whether you were a clergyman. And because of the inertia of English law, by 1600 or 1650, when almost half of all men could read, it was still the case that you were convicted of a felony, any felony. You could call for a Bible, read the appropriate passage, and then be excused. <laughs> and so, as I say, it's, it's an irony of English society that, and a large fraction, I've seen the court records, there are significant numbers of people who escape punishment in this way in the courts in this period. Uh, despite that, England actually has these very low murder rates in this period. And so there are examples of quite peaceable societies in the pre-industrial world. There are also examples of societies with very high levels of violence. And it turns out that, for example, uh, systematically, hunter-gatherer societies tend to be much more violent than settled societies. Uh, it's just a, a feature of their structure where there's no formal government, there's kind of an informal band, and disputes tend to be settled by violence, and also there tends to be a lot of raiding on other bands. And so you have these, these very uh, high rates of violence. And so, for example, amongst the Ache, uh, more than a quarter of all men die violently in that society. Right? They die through murder <laughs> of one kind or another. Amongst the pre-industrial English or Japanese, it might be only 1% of all men who would die violently, even including foreign wars in this calculation. Okay? And so you get this contrast. There are some societies in the pre-industrial era that have high levels of violence. There are some that are quite peaceable. What's the effect in terms of living standards? Well, it turns out a violence that just is this interpersonal violence that's pushing up this death rate schedule, that just increases living standards. Right? And as I say, it, it can reduce overall life expectancy, but if fertility is pretty flat, it can actually have very limited effect. It might have very limited effects on life expectancy. And so if you want a society, if you have to have social rules, one where people periodically engage in large-scale violence against each other is actually going to be a richer society than one in which you arrange to have complete uh, peace and uh, good order. Right? The, by the way, the, one of the reasons they actually have these high rates of death from violence is that they actually have a kind of very interesting structure where in ordinary day-to-day -day events, it's impermissible for men to display anger towards each other. Right? It's just a social rule. And even over things like uh, infidelity, it's just not permissible to, to call out a conflict in this case. But periodically, the leader of the band, every six months or a year, will call for a club fight. And what happens on the day of the club fight is they clear several acres of forest. And all adult males in the band have to show up with a club. And the rule of the club fight is simply anyone can attack anyone. Right? And it goes on till everyone has settled every grievance. And then they go back to peace. <laughs> right? And the, the women actually gather around the edge during the club fight. And of course, you don't know who. You know, since it's not possible in this society to express a lot of irritation normally. The question is, who's going, to, you know, who's going to be after you in the course of the club fight? But what actually happens after that is a lot of marriages are recontracted. So that if you display cowardice in the course of this, uh, you might well end up also losing your spouse in this case. Uh, and there's actually a lot of suffering afterwards because there's a lot of injuries. And then remember, they have to move all the time and hunt all the time. So it's a period of hunger after the club fight because of the injuries. But the question is, well, why do the chiefs call it? And the answer is that it's just fun. Uh, they don't tend to get injured because they're amongst the most powerful people with the most allies. Uh, 
Uh, and it just relieves the monotony of the society to have this uh, periodically. But if you think about this, what is the net effect of this in terms of living standards in this society? It actually improves living standards, right? And it might have very little effect in terms of overall life expectancy within the society. Question here. Uh, yes, yes, people die. It's not a huge rate. Uh, they have, they actually have other practices that also uh, magnify the death rate. And one of those is, um, if someone dies uh, to expiate their grief, they typically bury a child alive with the person who's died. <laughs> and uh, that, so it's a, a feature of this society is that a lot of children have had this experience of a discussion around the grave saying, well, what about this one? <laughs> and it tends to be the children who don't have, who are orphans, who tend to lose. Because if you have a parent or some protectors or that, you're not the one. Uh, but that's another reason why the very high rates of death from violence, which is this, this sacrificial violence that they have. But as I say, it still implies that this kind of society would have higher material living standards than one that engaged in widespread peace, right? That peace is actually not going to, if you're thinking about material living standards, peace is not necessarily going to help you. And as I say, with a relatively flat birth rate schedule, it could be that you would say totally and unambiguously, it's better off to be in the violent society. Because in every society, you're going to die from something. The more we increase the rates of death from violence, the less we have to have people die from misery and want, right? And so it's better to be in a society where you meet your end at the end of a club at some point, but after having lived well until that point came, than one where you're going to live on the margins of life until the point that your, your health finally breaks down and you die of sickness in the end, right? And so the argument is, you know, it's a quick way to go in many of these societies through violence. And uh, it, it's, it's, you know, if you had to vote, this is the argument. If you had to vote between these societies, the, the argument would be, well, maybe we should actually choose. If I had to send you back now and say, okay, I've got a machine, right? I can either send you to Akshay society or I can send you to Japan in 1750. <laughs> Which do you want to go to? And you would say, well, tell me, does, what's the rate of violence? T send me to the one that's more violent, in that case. There was a question over here. Um, the question here is, well, look, uh, uh, this is focusing on living standards. There's also the issue about people's choices. I mean, wouldn't people want to avoid death and uh, uh, excess deaths? And here, it's just it's an interesting empirical issue. But I did already mention London, for example, in Britain, where there's large-scale immigration into London in each generation of people who must have been very aware that they are actually exposing themselves to much higher uh, uh, death risk, w w risks, but in return for much better material living conditions. And we also see in the, the case of uh, Europe that companies like the Dutch East India Company sent huge numbers of young men to Asia as part of their colonial exploits. A very large fraction of those men died in Asia because they were exposed to tropical disease environments which are very adverse. But it was a calculated gamble by these guys that if you could go there and survive several years, to serve out your term and get back to the Netherlands, you were going to be set for life. You were going to significantly improve your living conditions. Uh, and so that we, we could actually go back in these societies and actually estimate what's the value that people place on life in these societies, right, compared to material goods. Right? And then it might well turn out to say then, well, in that case, we can say unambiguously, given people's own valuation of life expectancy versus material goods, a good government in these societies would try and increase the rate of violence, right? That that would be something <laughs> that would actually improve the conditions of people in the society, right? Or that a society would agree 
We just need a way of actually having the death rate increase through some kind of ritualistic violence uh, within the society, right? So it is an oddity of the society that peace can, and we'll sh I'll show you when I show you empirical evidence, a very peaceable society like Japan can be associated with astonishingly low living conditions in the pre-industrial era. And it, as I say, it's not clear if that's a good outcome, is to actually have a good public order. Uh, what else, uh, uh, and in line, so, so this concerns birth rate issues, all of these concern death rate issues. Um, another thing that would be a benefit for the society are periodic harvest failures. Right? Uh, what would be bad would be public granaries. So what happens is that in some of these pre-industrial societies, the government basically left it up to people to take care of themselves when there are these periodic harvest shocks. And so, for example, in Western Europe from 1315 to 17, there was a huge series of harvest failures that killed about 10% of the population. Okay? In other societies like pre-industrial China, government actually played a very active role in constructing systems of public granaries which would then give out food allowances to the poor in times of harvest failure. Okay? And so you had these different responses, a free market solution or one with government intervention. The question is, uh, which society is going to be the one you would prefer to live in? And the argument is, well, a society with the public granaries, what happens then is that the poorest people can actually survive in this society. And consequently, you're actually going to have a lower death rate schedule in that society because if you know, one year in 10, there's simply no food and only the, the, the better off get to survive, then on average, the, the, the death rate in that society relative to the income is going to be higher if there's this periodic culling of the population through these harvest failures that the government is doing nothing to offset. But in a society where the government actually stores up grain so that this culling effect doesn't occur, then the argument is, again, simply that, well, in that society, uh, more people will survive, living conditions have to go down. Right? And so it's just the exact analog of violence, that in this world, the argument would be there's no point in doing things like offsetting harvest failures, because harvest failures are actually improving average living conditions. Uh, and you're just making the average person worse off in material terms by supplying public granaries. Now, it was this directly was a kind of insight, an insight that entered classical economics. And what actually was happening was that in pre-industrial England, in the 18th century, a very elaborate system of poor relief developed, where English people had a right under law to go to the government if they couldn't support themselves and to get support from the local parish. And so you actually had a, a legal right, which is actually probably better than in some southern US states now, to actually demand relief from, from the government. And under that law, by 1800 or 1810, even though England's a relatively wealthy country, at least 10% of the population is in fact living year to year uh, using some public support. And it becomes a very elaborate system of provision uh, for the poor. And uh, they extend the right and they say that, for example, if you have more than three children, then we take care of all the additional children that you have. If you're sick, if you're unemployed, if you're elderly, that's how people live their lives. And in, in, for poorer people in any society, and this is true of, of modern America, there's a large fraction of the population that has no assets. Typically, 40 or 50 percent of any society will have absolutely nothing to live on apart from their wage income. What would then happen in these societies is when you got old, if you were lucky enough to survive to your 60s, you can't work anymore. People break down physically. And so if without some kind of public provision like this, either your children have to support you or you're going to, to die. And so what happened in some societies, England in particular, was the development of this elaborate system of support where people expected when they got old, if they were poor, that then the poor relief system would take care of them. And the classical political economists actually argued strongly that this system should be eliminated. Uh, and the argument simply was 
that it was simply encouraging the fecundity of the poor, <laughs> driving up the population of the society, and driving down wages for everyone <laughs> within the society. And that consequently, what you had to do was to eliminate these kinds of provisions that would actually I increase fertility of the poor, or allow the poor to support themselves in this way. Okay? Uh, and that's why, as I say, it became very controversial, classical economics. And there was an, actually a, a famous uh, reform of the poor law in England, in line with this, uh, in 1834, uh, which instituted the modern poor house uh, with these draconian uh, regime, uh, which was simply an idea of, well, how can we preserve the legal right to poor relief, but make it so unattractive that no one will actually ever apply for this? Uh, and so that's all connected with, as I say, one of these insights of classical political economics that uh, poor relief of any kind is actually poor. Uh, and then, uh, again, amongst virtues, we get infanticide and a vice is parental solicitude. You can look these up in the book if you can't see exactly how these are spelled. Um, it turns out that that was another variation across pre-industrial societies. Uh, Europe... Christian Europe had a horror of infanticide, and it's practiced very little. And in fact, there are very heavy sanctions against this. Uh, Asian societies, East Asian societies, typically allowed infanticide. Uh, and consequently, when you look at pre-industrial China, pre-industrial Japan, a large fraction of women uh, die. Now, we don't know exactly how, whether it was neglect, deliberate action, but something like 30%, as many as 30% of all women are missing from these societies in the pre-industrial era. Uh, and uh, we're pretty sure that that's a result of deliberate action. Uh, but it turns out that, as I say, this will improve uh, material living conditions in the society which practices infanticide as opposed to those that don't. Okay? And so, it, as I say, it is this topsy-turvy world in terms of uh, what's good and what's bad within this society. Now, um, another thing is, and, and this relates to the, to the bottom curve in the diagram, it turns out that this is a world where indolence is good and hard work is bad. Okay. And that, actually, this is one of the most surprising implications of the Malthusian uh, model. And how does that show up? Okay. Well, it, it turns out that we can get measures of how much people worked in various pre-industrial societies. Anthropologists go and, and do time diary studies where they sit around with a, a diary and record modern hunter-gatherers. What are they doing? Right? And it turns out <coughs> that the median across a group of 20 or 30 societies that have been observed on modern hunter-gatherer societies suggests that a male in those societies will work something like 5.9 hours a day. But counting as work everything, such as preparing, you know, hunting, repairing your habitation, looking after children, cooking, <laughs> preparing weapons, right? There's less than six hours of actual work a day in these societies. And that means that the other 18, more than 18, is spent on sleep and lying around <laughs> and gossiping, right? Uh, <coughs> So it's a world of surprising amounts of leisure, <coughs> hunter-gatherer society. We know that England, by 1800, if it's typical of settled agrarian societies, is actually a society of very intense labor efforts. We know this in several ways. One thing is that we have the work hours of agricultural workers and also of building workers. We know how many hours a day they worked and how many days a year they worked. And the answer is, for those workers, in paid work, they worked an average of 8.2 hours per day, counting every day of the year. Right? So just from paid work, they're actually, because they have a typical 10-hour day and they work something more than 300 days a year. They take Christmas Day off, but not very few other days apart from that. Right? And so they have very, very high labor input. There's a second source. That doesn't tell us what they do in other times, 
there's a second uh, very nice source uh, that um, uh, a researcher called uh, Joachim Voth uh, did a study of London in the late 18th century where he got the records of the court proceedings. And these records have lots of witness statements, and these witness statements say, at 8 o'clock when I heard the window break, I was doing the following, right? Or at 9 at night when I heard the scream, I was in my workshop doing whatever, or I was asleep when I was woken by whatever. So, so that these witness statements are actually a random set of observations of what people are doing, but all often dated exa given exactly in terms of time because it's an element of the crime. You know, what time were you doing this when this happened? And so he was actually able to assemble these into a complicated database, which is a picture of London, 1750 to 1800, in terms of well, what did people do with themselves, where you can measure every activity and the extent of those activities. And the answer that comes out is that the average Londoner in this period is doing more than nine hours work a day. Right? And so that the English, by 1800, are working more than 50% harder than the typical hunter-gatherer. Right? There has been this very substantial increase in work effort. And the question is, well, why is it that the, the apparent indolence of hunter-gatherers would be a good thing in the pre-industrial world, and the very high labor inputs of a society like England are actually a bad thing? And to think about this, let's think about our diagram here. And imagine, it, it, it turned out, the claim is that England in the Middle Ages had much lower labor inputs. Uh, the church calendar, for example, called for 10 days holiday at Christmas, right? Uh, which is something that was never observed later. It was also a rule in the church calendar that every feast day, and there's something like 50 of them, aside from Sundays, you can't work on. And the half day before every feast day, you have to get ready for work on the feast day. And so if people were actually following the ecclesiastical calendar, there'd be a large fraction of the days of the year which would actually be spent in something other than work. Right? And so the claim has been made that uh, if we go from the medieval period to the modern period, that there's actually a big increase in labor inputs. Why would this be a bad thing for the society? So think about starting in some initial phrase here, say, where we're in the Middle Ages and there's six hours of work a day on average. Suppose a reformation comes along and now we increase to 10 hours a day. What's the effect in terms of this world? The effect initially is a shift outwards of this curve. Okay? Because what's going to happen now is that at the existing population, now we can get this much greater output per person because there's so much more labor input. Right? We increase the yields in agriculture, produce all kinds of new goods with this greater input. But when we go to the top part of our diagram here now, the initial effect will be, oh, living standards are now much higher in this society. But that's not an equilibrium anymore because now birth rates exceed death rates. Population has to start increasing. We start moving along this curve here. Eventually, by the time the process is finished, we've actually just moved up here. So what's the result? of this massive increase in labor input in the society. Material living standards are the same as they were before. Life expectancy is the same as it was before, because birth rates and death rates are the same as they were before. The population has increased substantially. But, no one, but now everyone's having to work 10 hours a day in order to get the subsistence as opposed to 6 hours a day. So the conclusion then would be, you could actually create a society where if you re eliminated the possibilities of work, you would reduce the population, but you wouldn't change material circumstances. That leisure is just an unambiguously good thing in this pre-industrial world. That hunter-gatherers somehow, by managing to have a social structure that leads to this indolence, are actually better off than if they were all out there working for 10 hours a day. Right? That indolence is just good in this world, and hard work is bad. You just end up with miserable conditions having to work harder and harder. And in fact, if people compete and then go up to 12 hours or 15 hours, you would just end up with higher population, but more and more people living on this margin. Okay? And so that is actually, as I say, one of the most surprising implications of this Malthusian model. It's that uh, indolence is actually a good thing. The next thing I'm going to show you is taxation turns out to be a good thing as well. <laughs> 
in this world. Taxation in order that the king can spend on luxuries turns out to be a plus in this society as opposed to a negative. But I, I'll have to show that uh, on Wednesday. Okay, we're done. <laughs>